It is an ever present tribute at tracks on cars and on this day in the garage. Dale Earnhardt's nearly three decade presence in NASCAR, both in the car and out, make him impossible to forget. The sport needed a, a superhero. Absolutely unreal what Dale Earnhardt's doing right now. He went out in every race like it was the last one. And Earnhardt still got the lead in Toronto. Daytona O. Dale Earnhardt. 20 years of trying, 20 years of frustration. Everybody I've seen all week said, this is your year, this is your year. He was Superman on four wheels, the common man who did uncommon things behind the wheel. Yet off the track, he was the guy you most wanted to be and the guy you thought you most could be. He was the intimidator. He'd lived through hard knocks and hard hits. And because of that, he was supposed to be invincible. Dale Earnhardt Sr. and NASCAR just went hand in hand. And for nearly three decades, they did. Until this day, 10 years ago, when it all changed. Wow. Dad would come into the bus and say, "Yeah, we all got cars that can win this race. You know, let's work together." And I'm like, "Whatever, man. I'm fucking working with nobody. I'm winning." He explained to me on Friday how the three of us together were going to win this race. It was going to take all three of us working together to win. The only time in his career that any of us can remember where Dale didn't really want to win the race. He's just back there, kind of running interference. He was driving very aggressively, blocking. And, uh, and I was kept telling him, I said, Larry, Larry, if Dale keeps doing that, somebody's going to wreck him. He can't keep cutting people off like that. It almost reminded me of, of a mother duckling or a mother hen protecting his two little uh, chickens up there. As it came down to that last lap, I said, boy, this is an exciting finish. Storybook finish, really, with Michael Waltrip in a Dale Earnhardt car and Dale Jr. right there and, and Dale Sr. trying to protect their turf. We get the white flags in the air and, you know, Michael and Dale Jr. go down into turn one and, and they got a little gap between everybody else and Dale's back there all over the place, you know, got everybody bottled up. We came off turn two for the last lap of the Daytona 500. I looked in my mirror and it looked perfect. And then it's all got clustered up when we went in turn three. I thought, everybody's not gonna get underneath Dale. You know, it's just not gonna happen. You know, I was down on the bottom as far as I could go, and uh, Kenny had, you know, Dale pinched down like we was all trying to race to check the flag. Sterling had a nose under Dale, and Dale cut him off one more time, and that was one time too many. What I saw was when we touched his car kind of turned down, and I went down too, so, uh, you know, seeing him go back out of sight. To the flag. Come on, Mikey, you, on, got it, you, got you got it, man. You got it, you got it, you got it, you got it. Oh, you got it. Oh, Michael Walter wins. You almost just wish we could have went off there right then. This is great. I just hope Dale's okay. I guess he's all right, isn't he? Darrell Waltrip uh, very somberly said, uh, I hope Dale isn't hurt too bad. And I thought to myself, he can't be hurt too bad. My God just knew from from the from the impact this season it wasn't that hard I mean it, it was hit but it, not like taken harder to me at that point everything was still okay everything you know we were just we just had you know dad just got caught in wreck and I was sitting on the pit box and I jerked my headset off and jumped down and I thought I better make sure he's okay I put my headset back on I said Dale you all right Dale you all right uh, and he never came back I just go over, walk over to Dale. When I took his net down, I was just, you know, I was just quite surprised as far as uh, the condition he was in. I think when I first realized that we, we might be in trouble here, I saw Kenny walk to the car and, and Kenny was in a panic mode. I knew he was in trouble. I knew he was in, in big trouble. You're looking inside turn three where rescue workers are helping Dale Earnhardt to get out of his car. I was the first physician to get to the car. We very quickly realized that you know, he's not breathing, and so we started CPR. We look in the booth, and we're on the, looking on the monitor. I didn't realize the first couple times, but about the time Dale hits the wall, Kenny Schrader hits Dale. 
And so not only did he go forward, but then he went that way. That scared me. Basically, once we started the CPR, it became very apparent that he had a basal skull fracture. At that point, he basically was a cardiac arrest. Um, and therefore s spending more time at the scene is not going to benefit his situation. While Earnhardt's driver Michael Waltrip celebrates, Dale Earnhardt rides the back of an ambulance to the Halifax Medical Center. Kenny Schrader called me around to the uh, side and said, I said, it's, it's not good. He said, well, I mean, we're going to be out for a while. And he was white as a sheet. And he said, and it just don't look good. Having to tell that to Richard was not, you know, I mean, I didn't tell him he was dead. I didn't know he was dead. I knew it wasn't good. As I was in Victory Lane, I just thought, I, I began to wonder more and more as time passed why Dale wasn't there and why Dale Jr. wasn't there. The first familiar face I saw was Schrader. Dale had just been, you know, what I thought would probably wind up being fatally injured. And Mikey just won Daytona 500 his first race. You know, I need to, it was no decision. I need to be down there, talk to Mikey. The moment in, in Victory Lane when I grabbed Schrader and I'm smiling, you know, and I was like, can you believe this? And uh, he just didn't look right to me. <sighs> I get to come up and tell him that. I mean, it's just, uh, I just, I just felt so sorry for Mikey. He said, Dale, it's not good. Just, just know Dale's, Dale's hurt. It's not good. And then uh, and he said, I love you, and left. They had the cameras on uh, Dale Jr. and Teresa rushing in to the hospital. Uh, that's when I started praying. One minute I'm going to Victory Circle, and the next minute I'm in a car headed to the hospital to check on, uh, check on Dale and see, see if what they're telling me is really true. I would say it was probably an hour or so I was sitting there with Dale Jr. and a few of us sitting in the room together and uh, when they came in and told us that uh, we lost Dale. The first time Buffy and I were alone, I said, he's gonna be okay, right? And I knew he was hurt, but I just was hoping that it wasn't the worst. And uh, she said, no, he's dead. This is undoubtedly one of the toughest announcements that I've ever personally had to make. Uh, but after the accident and turn four at the end of the Daytona 500, uh, we've lost Dale Earnhardt. Silence at a NASCAR track is traditionally awful. And it in situations like that, it traditionally the silence grows louder and louder and louder. Just shocked, just, just shocked, just couldn't believe what had happened. I remember going up there and sitting up uh, about all night long, Sunday night, uh, thinking it was a nightmare. One thing that I didn't ever understand, and, and I don't think I ever will on this earth, is why it had to happen, you know? Why that have to turn out like that? Dale Earnhardt was Superman. We thought that Dale would never be hurt. And we were wrong. Fans describe their emotions regarding the loss of Dale Sr as still raw and he is remembered the threes the flags the earned heart it is remembered and ever present much more welcome back to nascar now here in daytona for our special tribute show as we pay homage to the life and legacy of the great dale earnhardt he didn't wear a hans device he wore an open-faced helmet his seat was very much old school, and his seat belts, shall we say, were installed in an unorthodox manner. Safety was not always at the top of Dale Earnhardt's priority list, yet it was his death that triggered a safety revolution. In our Outside the Lines report, we investigate how that day in 2001 
brought much needed change to an otherwise dangerous sport. Three wide behind them. You got him, Mikey. You got him, man. You got him. Come on, man. Come on, baby. Come on. Get him in the fold. Get him in the fold. The three cars out. Oh, big trouble. Oh, big wreck right behind on, them. Beat him back. Come on. To the flag. Come on, Mikey. You got it, man. You got it. You got it. You got it. You got it. Mikey! Michael Walter wins. This is great. I just hope Dave was okay. I guess he's all right, isn't he? This is undoubtedly one of the toughest announcements that I've ever personally had to make. Uh, but after the accident and turn four at the end of the Daytona 500, uh, we've lost Dale Earnhardt. Nobody could really get their arms around the fact that Dale Earnhardt was dead. It just, it just didn't seem possible. And uh, all the wrecks I'd seen him be in, all the things I'd seen happen to him, and he always got out. If you go back to the late 90s and even into 2000, our sport, we were working on safety. But you know, quite honestly, we were probably not working on it with a sense of urgency. Well, in the closing lap of the Daytona 500 in 2001, the door got kicked slam off the hinges. The icon of our sport, Dale Earnhardt, seven-time champion, the ambassador for NASCAR, got killed. He had what I feel were life-ending type injuries at the time of impact and really nothing could be done for him. The sport revolved around Dale Earnhardt and when you lose that, when you lose your biggest star, you got to figure out how to not lose the next one. I think it really made NASCAR step up and say, hey, we've lost our, our marquee driver and we've got to make his car safer. There's no question it accelerated everybody's sense of urgency on working on safety. Bill France, I'll never forget, he absolutely mandated that we will, we will never lose another driver again. We will build a new car, the COT. We will mandate whatever it takes. When you look at the, the, the effort that was put in to make the cars safer, the walls softer, um, you know, the, the magnitude of the seat construction has just been unreal. Dale Earnhardt is making some changes to the seat. 99, I drove Dale's car and it had a bus seat in the bottom of it with springs. And, you know, today, you know, you have a carbon fiber tub that's built to you. The Heinz device was developed. Uh, my brother Brett was one of the first, if I think the first to try that. Uh, we all thought it was crazy. You know, other things that within the car, the size of the cars, uh, the extra room, moving the driver away from the, the door bars, uh, the, the fastening of the seat. Most of those items have come from that accident. They didn't just look at one thing. They didn't look at, okay, if we put the Hans device on, that'll fix our problem. They did a comprehensive uh, uh, report of everything that they could possibly do to make the sport safer. Oh, Gordon comes off. He got canceled. He got canceled. Oh, and there goes Jeff. Jeff's in the inside wall. I couldn't have hit the wall at a worse angle, you know, and it really tore the thing up. And, you know, I, uh, I, I, I tell you what, several years ago, you know, those types of hits, you, you wouldn't be standing here right now. Every one of those things that were done and have been done have saved drivers' lives. I look at uh, Michael McDowell at Texas qualifying. Whoa, whoa, guys, whoa, whoa, oh, no, oh, my gosh. If there was ever a more horrendous crash and the guy raced the next day, that says so much for these race cars. It says so much for what these racetracks have done with this safer barrier. That is unbelievable. Every racetrack that any of the top three series goes races at, we have safer barriers. When you look at all of the race cars, the seat technology, when you look at this car, quite honestly, I think it accelerated uh, the, the breaking out of this car that we race full time today. Oh my God, wow. Huge crash here at Watkins Glen. Heavy contact. Jeff Gordon involved. I say we're done for the day. Jeff Gordon at Watkins Glen. Horrendous crash. And the guy was okay. He walked away. And, and that's just, that's, that's uncomprehensible to an old guy like me. I've fought the wall, and the wall always won. Title leg in the 80s, and we was running 210 mile an hour, and you're sitting there with a no headrest and sitting in a big old seat, sliding around. and. You know, at the time we drove them cars in 01, I thought it was really safe. We had a time where it was recommended that you wear a helmet. 
I mean, you know, so, so the sport went from being a very, I don't want to say lackadaisical, but NASCAR not wanting to be involved with it, to now NASCAR is the leader in the industry. I know 10 years is a long time, and I won't say that we would not have all these things, but there's no question it kicked it in gear a lot quicker, I think, when Dale Earnhardt was killed. Brian France and Mike Helton deserve a tremendous amount of credit for taking the initiative. Now, a lot of people underneath them made it happen, but those guys at the top said, hey, look, we got to get a hold of this, and, go, and, and they've done an incredible job. Because it was Dale, and because it was Daytona, and because so many people, I think, felt uh, guilty that they hadn't done something before then. I, I think that's that's why so many drivers should be so thankful to Dale for what he started. Thankfully, in the 10 years since Earnhardt's death, there has not been a single fatality in the Sprint Cup Series. In fact, it's hard to even remember the small injuries. That's not to say, however, there haven't been some violent crashes. There certainly have been, yet drivers have managed to walk away. And Nicole, it's funny. The worst injury I can remember to a driver in the last couple of years did not come inside a race car. It came in a game of Frisbee. Or falling off of a golf cart at times. <laughs> Ricky, though, for you as a driver, after Dale Earnhardt died, how did it make you feel when you had to climb into the race car? Well, I think among the fraternity of drivers that we all looked at Dale, even though it was sort of an unspoken message that he was our leader in all aspects of our sport. So when we lost Dale, none of us knew how to act or feel and how to make sense of it. I was flying home with my wife, and she, and she finally got me to the point where I talked, and I said, you know what? If we can lose Dale, the rest of us don't have a chance. And that's the only way I could put it in words. The Hans device was one of the new things back in that time period. How was it viewed pre-accident? Well, the way it was viewed was it, it was an idea uh, to use it. And some of us tried it. And I got to tell you, it was absolutely uncomfortable as hell. It was terrible to put it around. I felt tough. It just didn't feel comfortable on me. It hurt my arms. It did everything, but they kept telling us that's what we needed to use. And I use, actually used a different device with a bunch of straps and stuff and kind of got used to it until NASCAR mandated the Hans device. And it's after you used it for a while, you got used to it and it felt totally comfortable. I'll never forget the first time I put it on. I could not stand it. I just felt terrible yeah. in it. Yeah. We heard Larry McReynolds say in that piece, it, it kicked the door and it forced NASCAR to, to pay attention to the safety that needed to be addressed. Brad, where do you think this sport in particular would be if it hadn't been the icon, the face of the sport that was killed on the biggest stage? I, I think you can look at before Dale Earnhardt lost his life where the sport was headed. Uh, you know, we, we, we lost Adam Petty. We lost Tony Roper and uh, we lost one of my best friends, Kenny Irwin Jr., a young man I brought into the sport uh, in 97. So uh, when Dale Earnhardt Sr. lost his life, it really drew so much attention to this sport. Uh, nationally, globally, because he was the iconic figure that NASCAR really picked up their pace. And thank goodness they did because we were seeing some catastrophic injuries to these young people driving these race cars because they were not safe and they were not, they were compromised. The, their head was compromised, the integrity of their head and whatnot without these seats and Hans devices and these better race cars. So I, could have been a lot worse. It is just one small part of how we were remembering Dale Earnhardt on this day, the 10 year anniversary of his death. And when we come back, we will continue to honor his memory, his legacy. What is the lasting legacy and how much has a father's passing affected a son? That is next. About one year ago, my editors at ESPN Magazine decided we would do a commemorative 10th anniversary edition to commemorate the life of Dale Earnhardt and analyze his death. They gave me four projects for, the, for that magazine, one of which I got to choose to do whatever I wanted, and I always wondered what kind of pressure the man that was charged with trimming that mustache was under, so I went and found him. Dale meant a lot to this town. The black and silver colors leading the way as he has all day. He was like a hero. Earnhardt stretching his lead. Dale Earnhardt. Hugging the inside of the racetrack. The poor guy from the little town that made it big. Earnhardt shows the way. Earnhardt swings up to the top. The man that could do anything with a car. Back to the checkered flag. Dale Earnhardt is going to win. The man bigger in life. My name is Steve Ellsworth, and I was entrusted in maintaining the hair of the Intimidator. First time I saw Dale walk through that door, I was nervous, you know, you got the big guy in black here, you know, he's the biggest thing around. 
To be the Intimidator's barber, it was intense at times, fun at times. Trimming that mustache was the, uh, the most intimidating thing. He had only been in here like three or four times. I'd always ask him, let me trim that mustache. He said, no, no, it's all right. But this particular time, he said, yeah, go ahead and trim it. So I trimmed it, you know, down fairly close. He looked in the mirror and he said, oh, hell, I said, you ruined me, you ruined me. He says, Wrangler's gonna fire me, Wrangler's gonna fire me. And of course, I was uh, almost shaking in my shoes. I thought, boy, I've blown it now. This guy will never come back. I remember back in 1986, he called me on a Saturday morning. And he says, uh, I need a haircut bad. It was right before he went over for the, uh, the bush race. And he's all fired up. He's ready to go. And got through cutting his hair. I had the brush, and I was just brushing his neck. So what are you, what are you doing to me? And I said, well, I'm trying to get all this hair off you. I said, this is the winning cut. You're going to win today and tomorrow. I listened to the bush race. The wife comes out. I said, Dale's winning. I think he's going to win this race, and he won it. On Sunday, we all went to the cup race, and of course, he won. He was standing up there, smiling and holding the trophy. And he looked through the whole crowd, and he pointed at me, and he uh, held up two fingers and did like thumbs up. When he came in the next time, he said, well, I got something for you. Got a picture over here. He had signed it, the winning cut. We actually had a game going. He wouldn't win a race for a while, and I'd call him and say, man, you need to come down and get one of those winning cuts. He actually uh, would win almost every time I cut his hair. Big trouble, oh, big wreck behind them. Those are the kind of accidents that absolutely are frightening. The day Dale died, I was sitting home watching the race. I saw the intensity of the wreck, and it really shook me up a little bit, but I had no clue that he would, he would pass on. After the accident and turn four at the end of the Daytona 500, we've lost Dale Earnhardt. It was a touching moment because I knew that relationship had passed on. In all my times with Dale, I was fortunate enough to see the real man, the tough guy, the good guy, the guy that had a heart. I think of Dale pretty often when I'm watching racing because I miss him. Miss seeing that intimidator out there intimidating everybody. Bumping, grinding, nobody was an intimidator. There was only one. Just inside the door to the right at Ellsworth Hair Design, Steve's uh, hair cuttery there in Kannapolis, North Carolina, is an uncanny pencil-drawn portrait of Dale Earnhardt. And when I asked Ellsworth about it, why he had it, where he got it, he looked at me and said, it's pretty eerie. It's almost as if he's fading away. Nicole. Marty, thank you very much. All of these stories, they're great for fans to hear and to, to reminisce. But, Brad, there is one person who every week bears his name. Every week, every track, he is asked about his father. Of course, we're talking about Dale Earnhardt Jr. How has he really been affected by these last 10 years? You know, it's really, really difficult for this young man. I've gotten to know pretty well over the last couple of years, and it's almost unhealthy to a point. The way he is always cast into his father's shadow. He has to live up to his father's expectations, and he is constantly reminded about the success and the domination that his father implored upon this sport. It is so difficult for him just to be himself, and I wish he could in some way, shape, form be himself, go out and drive the race car, drive it the way he wants to, to drive, be as successful as he can be. He doesn't get that opportunity to do that, and it makes it very, very difficult for him to be Dale Earnhardt Jr. And if you listen to the words of Jr. himself this week, told our Marty Smith, it happened, you have to get over it. But let's talk happy thoughts, favorite memories of Dale Earnhardt. Let's start with you. Oh, favorite memories. Uh, my, my favorite memory is when he won the 1998 Daytona 500 for sure. I mean, I, I led that race a lot today, uh, that particular day, but he won it, and everybody wondered when Dale was finally going to win the Daytona 500. And he won that thing, and every doggone crew member came out on pit road and stood out there and high-fived him and congratulated him. And I'll never forget that day. I just never will. They, it was a monumental day in NASCAR, and I was really, really happy for him that day. Yeah. It was a special day. I remember driving up beside him at Sears Point when he got his first road course win. Looking over, he puts the window net down and gives me a thumbs up. And I'll never forget being in the driver's lounge of Bristol and uh, the way he would talk trash to the other drivers, you know. <laughs> and he used that intimidating factor outside the race car as well as he did on the track. He gave you nothing, nothing on the track. We discovered after his death, he gave a lot outside the track. Yeah, and Dale Earnhardt Sr. for me, I, I tell the story of going 
you know, coming down the, the racetrack at Charlotte and uh, someone saying Dale Earnhardt Sr. wants to talk to you and I'm trying to figure out why he wants to talk to me. Well, he just opened a new car dealership and he wanted to give me a hat to wear around the racetrack because I was the tallest person at the track. Just a great, great guy, great prankster, and we truly miss him. I will say this. If you didn't know him, like myself, I feel like I missed out. Yeah. If you did know him, if you were a fan, he will always be missed. Dale Earnhardt Jr. died 10 years ago on this day, and he is still remembered. Thank you at home for watching NASCAR Now. We will see you tomorrow.